Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the NextEc PLC investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and will publish those responses where it's appropriate to do so. Uh, before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll, which will just appear on your screens now. And I would now like to hand you over to the executive management team from NextEc PLC. Uh, John, good morning, sir. Good morning to you all. Thanks very much for dialing into our FY23 results presentation. But before we talk about the company, I'd just like to talk a bit about how we see the industrial technology markets and the equipment that's supplied into them. So the first thing is that in all of the industrial technology equipment now that uh, is supplied, there's typically a computer at its heart. And the way that we're interacting with that equipment is changing. So we're increasingly using touch screens. We're increasingly using uh, voice recognition to be able to talk to these devices. Uh, and that's driving a metamorphosis in human machine interaction. The fact that everything's got a computer in it means that software now is an increasingly important part of the technology stack. And we're seeing an increasing level of reliance on these devices to replace labor in, in, many, uh, in many markets. Customers have got a legacy of technology uh, in, their, in, their, in their businesses, which is driving an increasing level of technology debt, which they have to at some point pay down. Uh, and that's meaning that having to spend a lot of money on R&D, in many cases that R&D isn't necessarily directly beneficial uh, to the commercials of their business. And that's where we come in. We enable customers in selected markets to outsource aspects of their machines which are not differentiating to their commercial success. And by doing so, they can focus all of their R&D efforts on the parts of their uh, equipment which makes the greatest difference to their P&L. Thank you, John, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so who are we? Uh, Next is an AIM-listed technology business We've grown significantly um, since listing on AIM in 2013 with revenues of $114 million in 2020, 2023. Innovation is at the heart of everything we do with more than 20 patents and trademarks. We're headquartered here in the UK, uh, but we're a global business with our 220 employees across countries in Asia, Europe and North America, with our products reaching customers in 47 countries across a variety of markets, uh, the biggest of those being the gaming sector. So let's talk a bit about what, how we grow the business, and then I'll come on to talking a bit about this, uh, these markets that we're into. So we first of all seek to identify markets where they would benefit from that outsource provider. So going back to this point where customers are doing things which is non-differentiating uh, to their business, they're designing technology which is non-differentiating, we enable them to outsource that to us. But there are selected markets where we believe they're more compelling for us to be playing in. We then acquire customers in those markets, uh, we undertake R&D to allow us to penetrate further up the value stack uh, within those customers to help them further. Uh, and from time to time, we may undertake M&A to accelerate progress in those markets alongside the organic growth that we deliver. So what makes for an attractive market? First of all, it's compliance led. So there's stringent regulations or they're very conservative markets, maybe some certification requirements. And reliability and quality is more important than price for the customers in that market. The software is multi-tiered um, and it's complex and it allows us to develop aspects of that software. We call it middleware, uh, which um, enables the customers to outsource also that software element to us. And the contracts are typically over a multiple year, uh, a multi-year basis, typically more than three years and in some cases up to 10. The technology is unique. It's technology which is not available to start directly off the shelf from the standard PC solutions that you get. And that's where we innovate and we generate IP and patents. And finally, markets which aren't typically large today, but they're growing in their structural technology evolution, which is driving that growth where we can participate. And the first of the markets where we entered into this uh, strategy was, was the gaming market. The Quixent brand is what we supply into the gaming market. And what we seek to do is enable customers to outsource computer platforms to us that sit at the heart of slot machines that are installed globally around the market. The computer platform is an incredibly important part of the machines. It's a very heavily regulated item by, uh, by all global regulators. But nonetheless, to the player that sits and plays these machines, it has no bearing on their, on their enjoyment of the machine. Therefore, while customers historically were manufacturing and designing these, machine, these, these um, uh, computer boards in-house, uh, they were spending a lot of R&D effort on something which their players didn't care about. That's where we came in. We enabled them to outsource that to us with a compliant platform that met all global gaming jurisdictional 
uh, requirements, uh, and they could then focus on the game design. And importantly, it's not just the hardware box that you see at the bottom right hand side of the slide here. It's also the software that sits above that hardware box. Uh, and that software is integrated into our customers games and it makes it easier for the customer to write that game to work on our solutions. There's some major customers that we supply to on the bottom left hand side of the slide here. You see some of the customers that we work with and it's a very big market. So globally, uh, the annual replacement cycle um, for the products that we could supply into that market is over three billion dollars. Now, realistically, some of the customers in that space uh, are, are probably going to be on commercial terms, which we wouldn't be uh, attractive to, wouldn't be attractive to our business. Uh, and also some of the products which are supplied into that market are um, not necessarily directly um, relevant for our product mix. So, for example, some of our cabinets wouldn't be necessarily um, applicable to certain gaming jurisdictions because they're not high end enough for that. So actually, when we qualify down that $3 billion total addressable market, $310 million is realistically very achievable for us to chase uh, with, with the Quicks and business. And we've got a 22% share of that addressable market uh, with, our, with our current product set that we have. Uh, so still plenty of growth available to us. And really the core thing for us about gaming is about expanding that um, addressable, uh, is about expanding that, um, um, that maximum percentage of the addressable market that we, that we have today by, by winning new customers. And the product life cycles are typically a three to seven year life cycle. In some cases, we've been supplying for up to 10. But when we started the business in gaming, we also believed we had opportunities in other sectors. And then the question was, how do we identify markets uh, in other sectors where we could play and deliver this growth strategy? And the answer to that came from us looking at where we identified this opportunity in gaming. And that came with the acquisition of Densitron. We acquired Densitron in, in 2015. And this is a business that provides electronic display modules to a wide range of industrial customers. Not only did this diversify and grow the group's revenue base beyond just gaming, but it gave us access to a wide range of, of, of industrial markets for which we can focus on. And the first of those markets that we are focusing on is the broadcast sector. So why broadcast? As Johan said, we were supplying industrial display components to the broadcast market. Uh, and in doing so, we were enabling customers to uh, have that, uh, that visual feedback on their equipment that is installed into uh, major broadcasting corporations, the likes of the BBC, for example, would be our customer's customer. But these display RFQs that we were receiving were for increasingly large displays, more graphical displays, and for adding touch screens on the front of the displays. And, and it was quite a solid trend that we saw through that uh, customer portfolio. And so we started to ask the questions, well, why are they doing this? And what was evident was they were looking for increasingly adopting touch screens in what was still a market, uh, despite the fact that we were still in the 2010s at this point, still a market which was using uh, lots of buttons when many other uh, consumer and industrial markets had moved towards touch screens. So we spent some time trying to understand why this was the case. And ultimately, this market was still very conservative. Um, the, the devices are very mission critical because it's very rare that you see a TV station or a radio station off air. And also, really importantly, the operators of the devices don't want to be don't want to be looking at the device necessarily when they're operating it because they're looking at who's operating it, who's who's um, recording the studio or who's on the theater and stage. So those those uh, those operators need to be able to feel where their fingers are on the device. And this is why they like the buttons so much. The buttons though were antiquated and it meant you had a lot of buttons and the buttons were single purpose. So what we sought to do is to enable the best of touchscreen technology with fantastic displays that sit behind them, but with buttons that are overlaid on them or rotaries which are overlaid on them, which allow the customer to be able to feel uh, those, those objects um, alongside seeing them, but still with that wonderful reprogrammability and flexibility that, that uh, a touchscreen offers. And so that's one of our example devices on the top right hand side of the screen. We also have put computing technology behind it to enable this control surface, the revolution of, of graphical user interface, interface based control for broadcast equipment to be easy for our customers to outsource to us. The market, um, $220 million worth of addressable market that we believe we can access with our current product portfolio today, long buying cycles, so five to so three to seven year buying cycles for the broadcast equipment um, and a typical ASP of over $1,000 considerably higher than the rest of the Denstron business and at much better margins. And we've got a very small uh, proportion of that addressable market, um, uh, only 4% today based on our revenues, and that's been growing double digit year, year on year. 
So that's a bit of a background around the business. Um, I'm going to come on to talk a bit about now um, how the year has been in FY23. So it's been a year where I've, I'm really pleased to say I've had significantly improved profitability and cash flow and also a resilient revenue performance in the context of what is a very difficult macro environment um, and has been high interest rates, high inflation uh, and just sort of customer sentiment has been weakened uh, by, by the sort of the, the, those macro factors. We've also seen customers going through a destocking trend, something that's very common in many technology companies. Uh, but despite those, those uh, sort of headwinds, we've been able to grow volume in the strategic gaming computer space and the broadcast sectors. Uh, and that with in significantly improved profitability, both at a gross margin level as a product mix um, has improved and as we've been able to take advantage of some of the, the uh, improvements in input stock costs. Uh, and that's allowed us to recover our margin back to, to more normal levels uh, compared to the sort of the drawdown we had in, in more recent years as supply chains were dislocated. We have seen lead times um, easing as well, which has been a, a, a much easier uh, supply side um, challenge for us. Uh, and that's allowed us to, um, to, to, to um, take advantage of that, uh, of that lower stock level that we have uh, coming out of the year. The order book, though, is also normalized. And again, many other companies are reporting the same kind of thing. So we've now got five months worth of visibility of 2024 revenues when we enter the year, uh, and uh, but it remains strong and gives us confidence for this year's uh, financial performance. We also um, generated good cash flow through the year. So we have a strong net cash balance entering the year and that's been enhanced. Uh, and that strong net cash balance allows us to take advantage of both organic growth in our core markets and to take advantage of acquisitions to accelerate that organic growth. Moving on to some of the financials then, and starting with the 2023 KPIs compared with 2022, spilling out some of the highlights here, uh, gross margin 36.3%, as John said, significantly up on the prior year, now back at historic highs, and in fact, this is the, the best gross margin performance for the business since the Denstron acquisition in 2015. Profit before tax up 45% to 14.7 million, and then just an excellent cash performance this year with conversion of 142%, driving our net cash balance up uh, to a record of 27.9 million at the end of 2023. Moving on to the income statement and just pulling out a few points here. Um, revenues down 5% and I'll get into that in a bit more detail by division in, in later slides, but um, overall uh, our volumes and our gaming in, in broadcast sectors did increase despite the overall decrease in revenues. And we also saw a more diversified revenue base with revenue from our top 10 customers at 51%, down 56% um, uh, in, the pre, in the previous year. Operating expenses were down about a million dollars or 4% or year over year as we benefited from smaller FX movements alongside good cost control. Uh, we earned half a million dollars on, uh, on, on finance incomes. We made the most of those higher cash balances, putting, putting cash on deposit and the best possible rates. Uh, and then just to point out around uh, EPS, you can see there EPS in line year over year, despite the increased profits. Uh, now that's due to the change in effective tax rate. So in, in 2022, we had a, um, a tax credit of $2.2 million. This was due to a deferred tax asset that we recognized on taxable losses that we have available to us here in the UK, um, which resulted in that sort of exceptional tax credit. In the current year, we had a more normal tax charge of, of $2 million or just shy of 16%, uh, which tempered the growth on our EPS had it not been for that tax change, our, our EPS growth would have been in line with our, with our profit growth. Moving on to revenues and starting with Quixen that serves the gaming industry. Um, revenues of just shy of $35 million in the second half of last year, in line with the first half as, as growth was tempered by customer pushouts and product mix, chain, mix changes. But pleasingly within, um, within the, uh, the overall Quixen revenues are our core gaming platform sales our volumes now increased by 5% year over year. We saw particularly high demand for our cost effective and mid range products. Now we, we make the same margin across all of our gaming platforms, um, but because of the, the higher relative sales of the cost effective and mid range products, it did see the overall ASP decline by 4% year over year. So we move to Dentatron. Um, and a resilient performance by Dentatron in what was a challenging market, um, a challenging year across across industrial markets. 45.1 million, broadly in line with the prior year, which was a record year for Dentatron. And what was particularly pleasing on the Dentatron performance was that higher, or sorry, those those revenues 
came in much higher gross margin and overall profitability in the uh, in the Denstrom business. And then specifically within the focus broadcast sector within within Densitron, um, revenues of eight point four million dollars up um, up twelve percent year over year, um, and that business now doubled over the last five years. And just in terms of the, that growth over the last year, that twelve percent um, that came in spite of some of the um, the broader slowdowns we saw in industrial markets was also impacted uh, the broadcast sector. And in the broadcast sector, revenues are also delivered at margins. Ahead of the ahead of the rest of the the Denstron business, staying with our with our gross margins and as I said, um, margins up significantly year over year um, to thirty six point three percent. You can see there margins impacted in twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one by component price inflation due to the supply chain constraints uh, experience uh, in those years, and the improved margin performance in twenty twenty three was in part due to recovery. Um, or a stabilization in the component prices, which allowed our, our gross margin to recover as the price rises that we put through in 2021 and 2022 came through the PL. Um, and specifically within the Denstrom business, we've really taken a step up in margin in this um, in this business from uh, sort of high 20s to low to mid 30% in that business. It really, it's been a focus on, on high margin business, um, higher value products. That's, that's driven a, a significant improvement in Densitron. Looking ahead, um, we feel there's still um, room for growth in our gross margin um, as we as the, the, the normalization of supply chains continuing to into 2024. And we're now also structurally selling more higher value products, which would allow us to grow our gross margin beyond levels that we saw pre-pandemic. Moving on to our profits, um, up 45% to 14.7 million. Uh, this year, really two main reasons for that. First of all, the higher gross margins that I've, that I've just talked about, adding 4.7 million to profits. We also then, um, we, we benefit from a modest FX gain of $600,000 this year. But when compared to the FX loss of 1.6 million uh, in 2022, um, the overall change was, was, was 2.2 million on FX. Um, offsetting that was the lower sales volumes and an increase in our uh, operating expenses um, largely due to heads um, that we added, commercial and, and, and engineering heads we added in our broadcast uh, our broadcast team. Looking ahead to 2024, we don't expect um, a significant increase in our operating expenses. Um, and then just looking at our, at our profit before tax margin, 12.9%, so significantly up on the on the prior year, um, and a step in the right direction of our of our um, medium term target of getting back to those mid team profit levels um, that we saw pre-pandemic. Uh, in terms of our cash, um, as I said, a really strong cash performance this year, up $15 million to $27.9 million. Most of that came from uh, the improved profitability, cash from operations, nearly $18 million. Um, we also added $3 million from a reduction in working capital. Now, over the last couple of years, we've seen a, an increase in our, in our stock as we made strategic stock purchases to ensure that we had components available to deliver to our customers. In 2023, we started working through that stock balance, um, allowing for um, a, re a reduction of working capital. And looking ahead to next year, we expect, or well, this year, um, we expect further reductions in our, in our overall stock balances. Beyond our operating, um, our operating cash flow, because we run a capital light model, there isn't really that many um, cash outflows. We paid a bit of tax, the capex is, is um, capitalization of, of R&D time. And we also pay a dividend of two and a half million dollars. Uh, the board is proposing a 10% increase in our dividend, which will be paid in 2024. And just um, on cash conversion, 142% um, in, the, in the current year, meaning over the last five years, we've averaged 119%. And um, we expect to continue to, to achieve high levels of cash conversion going forward. Um, just in terms of capital allocation, um, our approach to capital allocation is to maintain a strong balance sheet, which means healthy liquidity. That allows us um, to continue to invest in the business to deliver growth in our established markets. Um, also investing in product, de uh, product development to ensure that that um, growth is sustainable in the long term. Complementing that organic growth with acquisitions to diversify into new markets. And whilst making these investments in organic and inorganic growth, we will continue to pay a dividend that we look to grow as we grow our earnings. I mean, all organic and acquisition opportunities have been satisfied 
we will look to return any surplus capital to shareholders. Let's talk a bit about um, some of the highlights of why uh, those financial results have been achieved. So the backdrop in the gaming market, particularly in the US, is that the casinos are seeing record levels of revenue. So FY23 was another record level of casino uh, gaming spend by the players in the US markets. Europe's been uh, was a was a more steady uh, recovery from COVID, uh, but has remained steady and uh, has delivered another good year of revenues, but but slightly below where it was pre pandemic. But the LATAM market really is growing uh, and that's a good opportunity for us and for our customers uh, to take advantage of increasingly countries regulating gaming in the Latin American space. You're also seeing an influx of new land-based market entrants through omni-channel gaming. So omni-channel gaming is where you play exactly the same game on a land-based terminal as you do on an online virtual, uh, virtual platform. And what you're seeing is there are an increasing number of online entrants that are trying to enter into the much more, much larger land-based market, particularly in the US. Uh, in, in, in the US. And that, um, that entrant of those online uh, customers into the land-based markets, they require somebody to help them with the hardware. They're software businesses that have never had to do hardware in the past. And our outsource offering, in particular our cabinet uh, solutions, enables them, enables them to take advantage of, um, of, of that new land-based revenue uh, to put their games out into. Uh, we're seeing good gaming unit uh, volume growth, so that low-cost IQ and ICON computer platforms were uh, were success stories in, in FY23. Um, that meant a slightly lower ASP simply because of the lower cost of those platforms for the markets that they're targeted at. But we are agnostic to margin, as Johan said uh, earlier. Uh, we've reduced volumes in our gaming monitors business, and we expect that to continue, uh, but that's partly down to the, the lower revenue profile of the monitor business carried. Within broadcast, uh, we invested into that business in the second half of 2022, uh, and we saw an acceleration of order intake on the back of those investments through the second half of last year with key orders from some major customers that are called out on the slide here. Importantly, the margins that we get from that broadcast business with these higher value products are at higher levels than the rest of the Denstrom business. And we are still uniquely positioned uh, within broadcast to provide these turnkey control solutions for the uh, broadcast equipment market. In other industrial sectors uh, where we supply Dentstrom's display components to them, we see uh, soft demand in FY23, uh, and we expect that to be something that continues going forward as uh, customers continue to go through destocking uh, and see weaker business confidence. And we are seeing margin performance, however, at record levels. So the Dentatron business has done really well to reprice all of its customers and get margins up to levels that are much uh, better than they were historically, and that's compensating somewhat for that revenue weakness. Uh, that we see just with that broader macro uh, theme of uh, industrial market softness. And we've also seen some evidence of some of our Asian competitors failing, um, and that's really just driven by um, the, the, F, the, the 2023 sort of inflection that we went from a supply constrained market to a demand constrained market. Uh, some of those competitors have now uh, struggled to continue in business uh, because they operate on such low margins. Uh, and so that's an opportunity for us to win extra business. So some of the new products we've launched. So in the in the Quitson business, we've launched two new uh, products in the last 12 months. One is called the IQ2 and one is the ICON2. What's the, the so what about these products is that first of all, they're based around Intel, uh, which is a very reliable and very stable uh, processor to be at the part of them. And that new processor has a much better set of, set of graphics capabilities than its predecessors. But also that they're repriced around a set of components which has been uh, available since the, um, since the 21 and 22 dislocation supply chains. And that means that they're at a much more compelling price point than their predecessors. Uh, and therefore, we've seen really good demand for them. And actually, if I take IQ2, we had 48 sample leads at ICE, which was a major gaming show in February this year. That's a really exciting product launch. And we're well positioned now to target the LATAM route markets and some of the more uh, mid-tier markets with these two new product launches. Over onto the Densitron side, Tactilla, uh, we launched uh, smaller tactile rotary controls. Uh, these smaller controls allow us to expand the market applications uh, that we can roll tactile out onto. A, a main reason for that is because the old controls were much larger and they wouldn't fit onto certain pieces of equipment, but these new controls uh, now enable that. So really pleased with how we're positioned on the product portfolio to take advantage of the commercial opportunities we see in the business. And here's a really, uh, a really good example of our, of our control solutions in broadcast in action. 
Um, we are um, installed into equipment which is being used at major sporting events, and you can see two uh, names here that you probably know of. Uh, the NFL, um, our, our equipment was used for the, uh, the game screening rooms uh, to control uh, those screens, and it's been also used at the Paris Olympics by one of our customers. Uh, and that goes back to a, a pitch that we did in 2022 um, to demonstrate our, our control solutions, which include, importantly, a software stack that makes it easy to design these, uh, these, these control panel GUIs. Uh, and that's used in these really high profile sporting events. So this is fo focusing on our, on our manufacturing operations. So we do all of our electronic product manufacturing through sub subcontractors in, in Asia with components supplied from Taiwan and China. So co but cognizant of the geopolitical tensions in that region, we made the decision in 2022 to explore a, a second um, manufacturing facility. And in the fourth quarter of last year, we had our first mass production run of a product in our second facility in, um, in Malaysia. And it was really an incredible effort from the team to go from initiation through yield testing to production in just nine months. Looking ahead to 2024, we will look to increase um, the manufacturing in Malaysia with both with, with, with um, production of both our quicks and the Denstrom products done through the, our Malaysian and Taiwan facilities. Um, and then also just pointing out on our, our gaming cabinet manufacturers, um, we have an existing relationship with the manufacturer in the US serving our customers in North America. And in the fourth quarter of last year, we, um, we entered into an agreement with ELAS, a respected Bosnian gaming cabinet manufacturer, uh, to support our, our customers in Europe. And then just finally on the right, um, in terms of our, our core processes, um, we, we now also have Intel and NVIDIA to complement our existing AMD um, relationship. So a broader range of, our, of core processes available. So in summary, um, last year we delivered a, a really re resilient revenue performance with volume growth in the core product offerings that we have in the gaming computer space and the broadcast space. Uh, we saw a normalized but still robust order book entering this year and we delivered record levels of gross margin um, that uh, is continuing to flow through that P&L and had excellent cash generation. And in terms of what that means, so we're confident in the outlook of achieving FY24 market expectations. Uh, with improved gross margins continuing and the focus on high quality revenue business being a part of our, 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 our future uh, and then also continuing strong operating cash generation and that gives us um, the opportunities to take advantage of organic uh, and acquisitive growth um, supported by that strength of balance sheet uh, and we believe that overall that set of ingredients gives us medium-term opportunities for transformation awareness enhancement in the business so why do I think we're interested in investment story? Well, those ingredients com combined with a, a fully resourced and experienced management team, which has managed through a number of very difficult years um, and also a very global business already. So we're in all those six countries that Johan uh, referred to. Uh, that gives us a great footprint to execute our growth strategy to leverage our core industrial computing expertise across new sectors, both through organic growth and through uh, acquisition. Thanks very much. That's the presentation. Um, I've got a number of questions that have come up, but please do ask any more uh, that you've got. Perfect. So. John, Johan, if I may just jump back in there. And thank you very much indeed for your presentation this morning. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab that's situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Uh, but just while the company takes a few moments to review those questions that were submitted already, I would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Um, guys, as you can see there in the Q&A tab, we have received a number of questions from investors uh, throughout your presentation this morning. And thank you to all of those on the call for taking the time to submit their questions. But uh, John, Johan, if I may at this point, just hand back to you to address those questions where it's appropriate to do so. And then I'll pick up from you at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have got a lot of questions. So thanks very much for, for asking so many. So I'm just going to go through through an order, actually. So first question is, do we have any pipeline M&A? Um, and, and yes, we do. Um, so in terms of the M&A pipeline, we've been working on that now for about nine months. Um, it's, uh, it's obviously a process of, um, of, first of all, identifying as many participants in the market that meet some of the deal criteria. We'd want a company which is focused on uh, some of those, uh, those sectors where they have the characteristics that I outlined at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, the right sizing, of course, ge geography, uh, synergistic with where we are today. Uh, so we've been working on that deal pipeline um, and uh, filtered out a lot of companies, clearly, that didn't meet those criteria. 
uh, but also I've got a short list of companies um, that we are that we are working on and, and hopefully we'll be able to close uh, one of those during this year but um, but that's something which is is continuing to be uh, to be to be picked up um, next question I've got which regions generate the most sales for broadcast uh, the US is the biggest uh, territory for us selling into broadcast um, some of the customers actually there's two major uh, customers in in Canada uh, that are sold out of our US office um, that's uh, Everts and, and, and Ross video um, but uh, yeah the US market is, is the biggest opportunity for us uh, for the for the broadcast sector um, next question is, they're seeing good growth opportunities in both businesses, as you've outlined. However, broker forecasts for FY24, revenue, PPT and EPS are broadly flat. Do you see these broker forecasts as being very conservative? So I guess um, if we sort of look at where, where we are today, so the markets aren't in a great place. We have high interest rates. I think customers' confidence is pretty weak. Uh, we're not taking any heroic judgments on, on, on where this year may be um, at this stage in time. Um, we do expect a second half waiting, um, and that's not atypical for this business. That's been quite quite common. Uh, but um, but you know, at this stage in time in the year, uh, we're comfortable where the forecasts are in the context of a sort of a wider industrial market, a slower period of trading, uh, but with good confidence in growth within the the gaming business and the broadcast businesses. So the next question, and actually just maybe so, so I don't talk too much, Johan, the question is, how do gross margins compare between Quicks and Denstron and Broadcast? Maybe you could pick that up. Yeah, so, so um, thanks, John. Uh, so typically Quicks and, Quicks and um, margins was at, at, or, um, at or around 40%. Um, as I mentioned when I, when I spoke earlier, Densitron on the display components side of the business, that was um, historically sort of in the high 20s, um, We've now moved those up to low low mid thirties, um, and then on the broadcast side, the broadcast business, um, as I mentioned, makes elevated margins compared to Dentron at those at those um, the same levels that we achieved within Quicks, and so forty percent plus. Okay, the next question um, on the broadcast equipment side, I believe motorized sliders are now pretty standard. Presumably, your solution cannot offer this. Does this cause an issue? Uh, really good point. So it is correct. Uh, many broadcast mixing desks uh, do have uh, motorized sliders. I guess there's a number of other applications um, for sliders which aren't on mixing desks. So I think you're right. I think on mixing desks, it probably doesn't fit in because they do have that uh, motorization. It's, it's impossible. But so far, anyway, we've not found it possible to be able to offer that um, as something that's installed on the touchscreen surface. Um, they are. They have got other applications, though. So, for example, video feeding uh, or video switching between one source and another source. That's a slider. Um, that's an area where we can use the slider. So, we've got sort of three essential types of tactile objects. There's, there's buttons, there's rotaries, and there are uh, there are faders. Uh, and in the case of faders, you're you're, you're very you're very much correct that um, we couldn't use uh, motorization of those devices. Uh, Next question, very roughly, how much of the Dentron revenue came from the largest customer? <coughs> what about the proportion of gross profits? Um, so Dentron is a very diverse book of business. Um, so, so in Dentron, we've probably got about three or 400 customers in total. Um, there are a number of accounts uh, which, are, which are larger than others, uh, but I wouldn't have said that any of those accounts are you know, more than one to $2 million of revenue. So. Um, so it's a it's a very diverse business, um, and in terms of gross profits, pretty proportional with that uh, with that mix um, of of revenue. Good. Thanks, John. Why don't I why don't I pick up the next one? Um, yeah, the question sure. here is: uh, inventory revisions have been on an upward trend recently. Is this proportionally more on the Quixen or the Dentron side? Do you expect provisions to abate in the current year? So it is correct. Yes, this uh, inventory provisions has has increased year over year. Um, the overall provision, um, more of that is on the on the Quixen side than on the Dentron side. This is in part just due to the the, the relative the relative sizes of the business, but also um, uh, we we typically have more raw materials um, used for the manufacturing um, of our of our Quixen products. Looking ahead um, to 2024, yes, I expect those provisions to to um, to abate in the current year compared to where they were in 2023. Thanks, Johan. So next question, I'm going to pick up. Um, if the proposed IGT every merger proceeds, how do you expect that to affect you? Um, so yeah, so for, for those of you that don't know, a couple of weeks ago, it was announced that um, every and IGT were going to merge. It's actually a, a sort of a, a spin out of IGT. So only components of the business are merging with every. 
Uh, that's expected per their public statements to conclude by the end of this year or early next year. Um, and so, you know, there's plenty to do along that time. There's the competition authorities that are um, assessing it. Uh, there's also the regulations that they need to, the regulators that they need to get through to, to combine their gaming licenses. There's lots of work to do. And in fact, that's some of the concerns that I think shareholders have got is, you know, how long that's going to take. But nonetheless, you know, within the next sort of 12 months or so, um, it's anticipated that that deal will close. Um, from our point of view, so we supply every 100% of the computer boards that it uses in its gaming machines. Um, we um, are, are obviously engaged with them, uh, trying to understand what this means for the future. What we understand is that we've got um, a good runway uh, beyond that, where we will continue to supply every because they won't be looking at rationalizing products um, across the, the two customers for a number of years. So it will initially be about content sharing that they're trying for, not, not, um, not sort of combining the platforms. But of course, this is a great opportunity for us. Um, so we now have a great opportunity to win the combined piece of business from the two companies. Uh, when they become one and uh, that could be you know very material growth for our for our revenue so I, I look at this very much as an opportunity for us to build the business um in into into the igt uh, gaming uh, gaming machines um next question can we expect dental margins to remain at the second half levels of fy23 going forward uh, really simply yes um we we think that we've uh, locked in a structural level of margin um, now that we can that we can maintain, uh, we were probably anticipating some degree of um, customer attrition um, after 21 and 22, uh, but actually we've been able to hold on to pretty much all that business um, and, and keep that margin. So pretty pretty confident in that going forward. Uh, next question, um, actually, do you want to pick up the F the question on FX, Johan? Yes, I'll, I'll pick up the question on FX. So, sorry, let me just. Just scroll there. So, um, fifty percent of the four point five million increase in adjusted PBT came from fortuitous FX gains of two point two million dollars. Do you have any hedging policies in place to minimise further adverse FX movements? Um, I think just as I mentioned when I when I talk through the results, um, the the two point two million dollars we only had six hundred thousand dollars of FX gains in twenty twenty three compared to one point six million dollars of losses. Uh, in 2022. So yes, 2.2 million of the movement year over year was related to FX. The reason that it was such a, a much smaller movement in 2023 was in part because of less volatile FX movements, but also because we've put in place um, natural hedges to minimize our overall exposure. Um, those are still in place. Um, we do not have any um, any other hedges in place, but that is something that we that we consider um, on a regular basis. Um, but but the, the focus here is about minimizing um, positive or negative the impact that FX has on our results. Uh, next question, if you cannot find a suitable acquisition over the next six months or so, would you consider a buyback of your shares? Um, so in the in the statement, we do have um, some reference to, um, to, to uh, putting in place a facility um, at the AGM. Uh, in order to enable buybacks so we will have the um the sort of the, the ability to do so uh if that resolution is passed um as johan said you know our capital allocation policy is to is really sort of a return of cash to shareholders being the last resort uh, if we can't find an acquisition so it isn't impossible that we would return cash to shareholders but our first priority is about quite acquiring a company uh, in order to um, diversify the business and, and add um, further sector uh, exp exposure to us <coughs> Uh, next question um, is around um, is around the shareholding requirement for exec directors. What is the policy for next deck? And if none, what do you believe is an appropriate shareholding for directors to align them with all shareholders? So uh, we haven't got a formal policy on that. Um, we do have, you know, so, so the executive directors do have, um, you know, a, a share in the business, um, and um, you know, and indeed have L tips to try and align them to that. We think that those L tips are, are suitable to um, engage them to be aligned in their interests uh, to, to, to drive the business uh, in the appropriate way and deliver shareholder value. And, um, you know, that's including sort of EPS and TSR measures uh, so that, you know, obviously both of those elements need to be uh, delivered, uh, which is something that shareholders would clearly want to be delivered um, in order for those LTIPs to be to be paid out. So we believe there's a good alignment with, with um, executive, uh, executive directors uh, financially and with the company's success for shareholders. Um, 
and there's another question here which is sort of you know largely similar so dividend yield is is under three percent which seems modest given the strong cash flow and net a net cash balance of 27.9 million are there any plans to increase dividends from the low yield accepting that from time to time there may be some potential capital locations with high priority pretty similar question answer to that is that um yeah we we, we uh, could pay a much bigger dividend but we believe that there are uses of the cash that we want to use beyond that you know principally as i said around acquisitions but yeah we we, we always review our dividend we have a progressive policy and expect that to grow as johan said earlier um you know with with earnings uh, but um but but at this stage you know the first priority is around how we use that for for an acquisitions path um dense on grit's operating margin from 10 percent in 2021 first half to 24 percent in 2020 sorry 2023 first half to 22 24 percent in 2023 second half what were the major drivers behind this half on half improvement do you want to pick that one up johan yeah um i think some of that was was, was just product mix some of it was you know, some of the actions that we've taken um that flowed through uh in um in the second half of the year compared with the compared with the first half of the year um overall as, as john said earlier i think the, the margins that we've achieved in 2023 um in dean strong we expect to continue to be able to, to deliver those margins um in 2024. <coughs> uh, next question is around manufacturing uh so the um statement contained uh, a mention of a proportion of manufacturing of our uh, products moving to malaysia um and just that the question was around you know providing a bit more details on that uh, so, so let me explain it. So, we 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 started work and we announced sort of in in the interim results. I think last year was the first time that we were exploring options in that region and we were doing testing. Um, the main the main reason it for it is just around geopolitical tensions around Taiwan. So, you know, it's a very uncertain thing. It's totally outside our control what happens uh, in that region. Uh, so, having a second manufacturing centre uh, to, to to provide some level of de-risk for that. Uh, we felt was prudent. It's something our customers um, were, were concerned with, and it's also something that our, um, our, our, our shareholders have mentioned to us in the past. So that's that's why we've we've added Malaysia as a dot on the map to manufacturing. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time doing yield testing. We spend a lot of time doing quality control around that factory, and it's a very you know well respected business. It's a large business that we're working with, um, and, and we believe that provides us some supply resilience um, going forward. Uh, in order to to produce goods in terms of you know what our ability is to manufacture we we will split manufacture between uh, taiwan <coughs> and malaysia although um, you know the anticipation is if 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 something did happen more significant we could manufacture all our goods in either one of those locations so the volume production would be there uh, in order to um in order to um support that kind of diversification of of um, of manufacturing capability um, next question, the outlook statement sounds a bit uncertain with the second half waiting and confirmation of meeting market expectations of revenue only. Why only revenue expectations and not also profitability expectations? Um, so, so the first thing, it all starts with revenue. Um, so, so obviously revenue is, is, is king here. Um, you know, we've talked about how we see margins continuing to be robust. Um, and so, you know, you can read into that, that you know, we, we, we're, we're pretty confident in market expectation for this year at this stage in time. But yeah, with a second half waiting. So that that's a, a very fair, a very fair comment. And then next question, what shareholder value criteria do you apply when evaluating acquisitions? Um, so I think I think probably the question here is, you know, is this acquisition the best use of our cash for a shareholder or, or are there better uses of our cash for, for a shareholder? You know, I look at it very much. You know, our, our current multiple, I think, reflects the fact that we do have a degree of concentration risk around the gaming sector. Um, I think that, you know, that multiple should be higher if we have a degree more um, diversity of our uh, of our sectors. Um, and, you know, therefore, that's why we're so focused on looking at acquisitions to enable that. We look at, though, of course, the uh, multiple that we're paying for the company. Um, we would look to use um, cash and debt. As, the, as a primary source of funding, it's unlikely we'd use any equity and therefore it would be earnings enhancing. And so therefore we believe whatever we acquired would be uh, would be a, you know, a strong um, value for, for shareholders, um, you know, all, almost without any question. And I think that's all of the questions. 
Absolutely, John, Johan, thank you very much indeed for being so generous of your time and addressing all of those questions that came in from investors. And of course, if there are any further questions that do come through, we'll make these available to you immediately after the presentation has ended, uh, just for you to review to then add any additional responses, of course, where it's appropriate to do so. And we'll publish all those responses out on the platform. Um, but John, perhaps before really just looking to redirect those on the call to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself and the company, if I could please just ask you for a few closing comments to wrap up with, that'd be great. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks very much for, for a really extensive set of questions. Always good to good to have some engagement and, and some good questioning around the business. So we, we think we're, we're well positioned. Um, we think over the medium term, uh, there's good organic growth opportunities. Uh, we've got acquisition opportunities supported by a strong balance sheet um, and, and very little debt uh, currently. Uh, and therefore, you know, that medium term earnings enhancement, we believe, is very much within within reach. John, that's great. And thank you once again for updating investors this morning. Um, could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can really better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of NextEc PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. So good morning to you all.